Hello, Integrated Science class. So today we're going to talk a bit about the history of electricity. Now, theories about electricity are fairly recent, but, uh, but the effects of electricity have been observed for a long time, um, going back at least, we know, to, to ancient Greece, um, so, so several thousand years. Uh, the picture that you see in front of you shows the philosopher Thales. He actually was writing a bit before Aristotle. Um, and he was one of the first to observe uh, these sort of strange effects that you got from amber. What you see in the picture is a, is, is a little block of amber. Um, and he noticed that if you rubbed it with fur, it took, it took on these strange properties where, for example, as you show in the picture, it could cause the little, uh, the sort of wispy fringes of a feather to move a bit. Or what they like to do is uh, sort of pick up uh, little dried pieces of straw that you have. Now, there was no particular explanation for what was going on, but, um, but this was a well-known property of amber in particular. Now, the word uh, for amber in ancient Greece was electron, um, which becomes the root then of... Um, of, uh, of electricity in general. Even during the scientific revolution, there wasn't a particularly satisfying explanation of what exactly was going on. What you see here is a book published originally in 1558. This is the English edition from 1658. Uh, but it's entitled Natural Magic, and it's supposed to be treating um, uh, these phenomena that seem <laughs> sort of too mysterious to explain, things like alchemy and astrology. And you can see number 18 on these of static experiments. It's these kind of experiments rubbing uh, amber, rubbing glass, we could create this effect that seems somehow sort of magically transmitted across thin air. In the 18th century, once again, you don't have a great explanation, but these become enormously popular as, uh, as demonstrations. There would be demonstrations where like, large audiences would be called, and, um, and they'd witness these fantastical things. One of the favorite things to do would be to suspend, it's usually a child, somebody fairly lightweight, you would suspend them from silk cords, and then you would generate a bunch of the static electricity, and you could transmit it then onto one of these glass rods. Uh, and through the glass rod, you transmit it to the child, who would then do things things like um, uh, lift up either little pieces of straw, little pieces of paper, uh, feathers, or, or the like. Here's another example where you can see actually how they're generating the, uh, the electricity. They would do it through uh, a static charge. So they would turn the wheel uh, really fast, um, which would create sort of the friction, the friction of a static charge. And then you can see sort of the boy is being sustained suspended by silk uh, threads, but he's transmitting the charge to the girl who then is waving her hands over little bits of paper that would sort of levitate through the air. Here's a, uh, here's a poem from the 18th century. Uh, this is actually from a series of cards, um, and so one of the cards was uh, of the electric lady. You can see, I know where to find this almost magic virtue that our philosophers name electric. Young beauties, it's in your eyes. So very sweet, very romantic, uh, but you can see the popularity of these sorts of demonstrations where you have the young lady. In this case, she's not suspended, but she's standing upon something which is, um, which is shielding her from the, the ground. Uh, and meanwhile, over here, this guy is generating static electricity, transmitting it to her, and then she's um, uh, creating the, the effect with her hand. So one of the audience members of one of these demonstrations was a young man named Benjamin Franklin. He doesn't look very young in this picture. There aren't any very good pictures of him young, uh, but he was young once. Uh, when he was 18 years old, he took a trip to England uh, in 1724 for about a year and a half. And one of the things that he did there was he attended uh, these sort of public science demonstrations, including one of these sort of electric boys suspended from uh, silk cords. So he returns back to America, and he really threw himself then into the study of science, and in particular of these electrical effects. So one of the early insights that he had was the suspicion that the lightning that you observed in the sky was related to this phenomenon of static electricity. Um, this leads to the issue of the famous kite experiment of uh, 1752. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit debatable. The, the, uh, ben Franklin's involvement with the kite is it's along the lines of Newton's involvement with the apple. That is, we don't have a first-hand account of it happening. We do have a second-hand account, which is considered fairly reliable by a person that doesn't have any reason to lie. Um, but at the same time, it didn't happen exactly the way that, uh, that it's come down in popular culture. For example, you can see on, on this um, 
uh, on this illustration. So the idea that Franklin is out sort of flying a kite in a lightning storm, uh, it's often seen as something recklessly dangerous. But uh, what, what he's actually doing is he's um, he's holding, so the, the, the rope connecting the kite to the key is made of hemp, which, especially when it becomes wet, becomes a very good conductor of electricity. But Ben Franklin himself is holding a cord made out of silk, uh, which actually would insulate him fairly well from this electricity. And then perhaps perhaps you're able to see it, I hope you can, uh, from the key down to the glass jar there actually is a wire, which again would have allowed the electricity to go from the key into this jar. Um, and the jar, usually these were called Leiden jars at the time, they were seen as being able to um, to uh, sort of hold the charge within them. So you could have taken that jar, for example, and um, and and used it in these electrical demonstrations with you know, sort of the boys hanging from silk cords. This had a practical component to it. Uh, very famously, Franklin um, developed the, the lightning rod to try to uh, help buildings from getting hit. This is the first one that he had, which is uh, still it's on display at the, the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. Uh, but there was also a real theoretical component. He was interested in this question of what electricity was. Um, and so he comes up with an answer which he publishes in this text, Experiments and Observations on Electricity from 1756. And the answer that he gives is that electricity is what um, was called at the time an imponderable fluid. That is, this is a fluid which has no weight to it, so it can't be, it can't be weighed, it can't be seen, it can't really be detected in any way. But the reason that you know it's there is because of the effects that you can observe. And in this sense, this is something that's actually quite a bit like gravity. Gravity was not something that you could see or touch, but it was something that you knew was there uh, because of the effects that it had. Um, so the way it worked, according to Franklin, was that uh, usually this fluid was spread out pretty evenly uh, across most of the world. Uh, but sometimes you could get sort of little pockets where you'd have a, sort of a buildup of, of too much. And if you had an excess of the fluid, that would uh, lead to a positive charge. Sometimes you'd have little pockets where, um, you know, it would all sort of rush out. Um, and if you had this kind of deficit, it would lead to a negative charge.